Welcome to Become an Idol. This is episode 19, Addy versus HPT versus Agile with Alexander Salas. I'm Dr. Robin Sargent, owner of Idol Courses. This is a place where newbies come to learn and veterans share their knowledge. In this episode, I'll be chatting with Alexander Salas about the difference between the popular instructional design models ADDI versus human performance technology and Agile. If you're interested in starting or growing your e-learning business as a freelancer, join me, Christy Tucker, and Dr. Nicole Papiano in the e-learning freelancer bootcamp. Enrollment ends April 10th. Find out all the details and enroll at idlecourses.com forward slash freelancer. I have here with me today the great Alexander Salas, and you may know him from Off the Cuff, which is an ATD Central Florida uh, YouTube production that Alexander is the host of. Um, and you also may know him because he is the owner and founder of Style Learn. Um, but really, he's just um, one of those um, known name brand instructional designers in our field. And he is going to come on and chat with us here on today. Uh, whoops. <laughs> and he's going <laughs> to come chat with us today about Addy versus HT, I mean, HPT and Agile. But before we get into all that, Alexander, will you please do like a proper introduction of yourself? Well, I don't, I don't know how much proper that's going to be because you like, you made me feel like I just won the Super Bowl. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Robin, for that. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. So yes, I am Alex Salas. Um, many things and some people call me many other things. But um, today, as, you, as I meet you here, I am a U.S. Navy veteran. Um, U.S. Navy combat veteran, and I really got interested in learning and development as soon as I started developing uh, troops. So I started developing my own troops. I, I, I reached a certain level of leadership in the Navy, and that kind of gave me, you know, I guess what everybody gets, the aha moment. So fast forward another 12 years, <clears throat> I worked for some Fortune 500 and Fortune 100 companies as an instructional designer specializing in e-learning, and then I decided to do my own company, actually not too long ago about three weeks ago. But I've been doing, you know, the side gigs obviously for about five years already. So really this is just now the and you know this because you're a business owner as well. Uh this is just now the the final chapter of, you know, setting the new journey. So what I do, uh, a lot of people know me in the articulate storyline or articulate uh, e-learning heroes community, because I do a lot of stuff there. I've done some samples there of work and I help clients today um, as a learning consultant, and a lot a lot of it has to do with the implementation of their learning. But I'm also a geek, as you know, and I do research and I post things on LinkedIn and try to help people discern certain things, which is the topic that we have today, those three different, you know, areas, right? Yeah, so you've already shared a little bit of your journey to become an idol, um, but my listeners really like the detail. So you're like, skip ahead, Fortune 500 designer. But what we really want to know is like, okay, so you started developing your own troops. Obviously, you started to see results um, in like your methodology. And you're like, ooh, I could get into this. So wh- how did you actually make the transition from you know the military and um, up-leveling your troops to like a formal instructional designer? Oh, okay. So you want to you wanna deep dive. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Everybody get your masks on and get ready to see a new world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, what the way that started actually, one of the things that I feel that I, I've been very, very blessed with is the ability to sort of look at the next thing and anticipate and kind of move forward. So I started developing troops in the sense of uh, based on my own success. I was a, I was a really, and I still, I think I still am a very good test taker. You know, I can take tests, I can study for tests and, and, and learn and all that. And um, 
So that's part of that's that's one of the elements you need to to promote in the military to actually in the next level you have to take in a knowledge test based on your on the next level you want to get into right so if you want to make sergeant you got to take a specific knowledge that is set on the standard in the military the other part of that is your performance review just like anything else that you do civilian jobs and whatnot so but without the test you're not going anywhere so <clears throat> uh, people sort of you know were were it was noted that i was very good at that and then i started setting up some study sessions for folks that wanted to do this. So I was really happy to, I sort of got that first aha moment when I helped about six people study and the six of them got promoted. So that kind of led, you know, I did that for a year and <clears throat> I watched, I watched a, um, I attended a uh, health education session and uh, a retired uh, Navy chief, one of the senior enlisted folks, was given this class. And then I realized, okay, this sounds like a pretty good gig. This guy is just going around and teaching classes. This is pretty cool. I think that's something I want to do. How do I do that? So I I asked him and he was like, well, you know, I, I got a health education degree. And based on my experience as well, that allowed me to do so. So I was like, oh, okay. So health education must be the thing. So I went to get a degree in health education as I was still in the Navy. It was an online uh, degree and, you know, yeah, I was out there, you know, out there in the desert and stuff like that. And then when we came back to the ship or we came back to a base, you know, get into the crack a, a laptop or something and submit the, the, the papers and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was kind of crazy, but <clears throat> I, I achieved that. And at a certain point, there was a class there uh, that was named Adult Learning Theory. Because, you know, as a health educator, you have to deal with adults. and. You, you have to uh, enable their you know, facilitate their behavior change. So for that, when I found adult learning theory, that kind of changed everything. And I was like, oh, this is it. This is what I want to do. And then I found out that there was a job. There was, a, you know, trainer. You could be a trainer or, you know, at the time, you know, training specialist. So I, I started looking up things. Now, the difference is in the, in the military, you know, you usually – uh, learn everything that you do in the military. There is an instruction for it. There is a there is a document that refers to it and gives you the info. So based on that notion, and that's what I knew to do. I started looking up documentation of things, and I found documentation on ATD, or at the time it was you know the American Society of Training and Development. It was about training and development. So I found ATD, and then from there you know started finding things and started learning more. Then I decided. I need to go get a master's in education and I got another master's in education. So that's how kind of everything got together. Wow. And then when you moved out of the military, so you had formal training experience and then you started connecting with ATD. And is that kind of how you landed your first corporate gig? Hmm. Well, yeah. So the first corporate gig, I mean, I, I don't know how much time you have. <laughs> take a while. But the first corporate gig, so I, I got a master's in, in uh, I got the master's in education um, from Triton University. At the time, it was Toro University Online. It was a university that actually international school, but it's a university that really catered to the military community because, again, you know, you're deployed, you're doing things, you can't be, you know, going to a camp or anything like that. Now, this is 2007. You know, we're talking about a full online college, so that was kind of. And, and still the way, even though the brand is not known, their, their setup was pretty advanced. And so I, I got the degree and I got out of the Navy um, at six years. And then I, my first gig was actually with a company that is now owned by Philips. So it's Philips. But at the beginning, it was called Respironics. Uh, Respironics is a CPAP machine, a medical device respiratory medical device uh, company started with masks, you know, so, so anybody that has apnea, sleep apnea, they're really familiar with this and they use the devices. So I became a, um, my, my actual role was a um, technical support specialist, but a lot, like 80% of the role was training, was providing training. And I was providing training all to service personnel 
on the devices and it was done in Spanish and Portuguese. So I had to go to, you know, I had to travel to all these uh, Latin American countries and do the training there. I then use, you know, whatever I learned in, in the masters and sort of design the presentations and stuff like that. I still think of, of that time, that period, I was a PowerPoint assassin, but, um, but you know, that's part of the, how you can observe things and how you grow. So that was, that was the first game. Oh, wow. PowerPoint assassin mm -hmm. as in like death by PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Death by PowerPoint. Yeah. No shame, no shame in my game. I, I recognize it. Although I did have somewhat of knowledge of transitions and graphic, you know, I started, that's how I started growing into graphic design because you don't learn any of these things on a, a on a master's degree. So um, I started then looking at, I started looking at the uh, visual aspect of it, visual design. And I always had an, an affinity for it myself, being creative and stuff like that. But then after having the degree, I, I was able to kind of, um, you know, uh, align them and kind of integrate those things in. Oh, okay. So, and now, now, like fast forward, now we're getting all the way into the weeds of process and methodologies. And that's uh, why I brought you on today, because that's like one of your favorite topics right now, right? To kind of break down um, Agile, Addy, and then it's like human performance technology, HPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Human performance technology. Okay, so why just these models and why the versus of, of these? Could you just... Like, why is this your topic of choice? Yeah, well, because <clears throat> there is, you know, I, I think based on what I'm watching and based on, on, on the conversations I hear in conferences, um, you know, one thing we had to mention is that I speak at conferences all the time. Uh, I, and I'm, I'm very diverse in terms of the themes that I cover. So gamification is one of the biggest themes I cover and other things. But in the essence, you know, I, I, th I think the still in doing the blog, I still think that the, the essence of everything that we do needs to be well founded in a good instructional strategy. And if you don't have that good instruct instructional strategy, then it doesn't really matter what you do. You can make pretty videos or you can make awesome pictures or you can make whatever. It's not going to get the results or at least it's not going to be measurable. So you can actually validate what you're doing as an instructional designer. So and, you know, there are contentions between what an instructional systems developer or practitioner is and what an instructional designer is today in a regular company anywhere. But, but I still think, you know, we always have these things on L&D, these conversations on L&D, like, oh, how do, we show, how do we show that what we do is effective? How do we do this? Well, you start with a good instructional strategy and then there are these processes and, you know, foundational methodologies that kind of help you get there or at least formulate. Right. So, so yeah, so that's the issue. And, and the three, and the three most popular ones are that you always hear, right? So obviously Addy being one of those, um, HPT is not something you hear too much, but there's actually strong evidence um, and there's, there's a sequential, you know, progress of that. And then you have, obviously, a lot of people today talking about agile and, you know, doing agile development for e-learning or agile or this and that. So there are some problems there <clears throat> because one of those things, you know, so one, one was created specifically for the creation of programmatic, systematic instructional strategy right and and that's addy but the question is okay is the addy is the addy that you know the addy that i know and the addy that the next person the person next door knows so that's usually not the case and um i wrote an article recently on linkedin that you guys can go check out that kind of gives you the origins of addy so where it came from what it was and how perhaps we came to how perhaps we came to define or always mention Addy. Now, what is Addy, right? I mean, is, do you want me to break it down? Oh yes. Do we need to? Oh yes. Okay. This is we are full of newbie <clears throat> instructional designers. We want it all the way down to freshman class. 
Cool, 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 cool. So let's take a, let's take a quick look at Addy, then uh, I'll give sort of a synopsis of it. Um, Addy stands for Analysis, Design, Development, Implementation, and Evaluation. Technically speaking, it's sort of a systematic process by which uh, some people have made comments as to, you know, will all instructional design models, you know, all instructional design models follow Addy. The main problem we have is that depending on how we approach what we're doing in terms of solving a problem in a business and instructional strategy, you need to have sort of measurable outcomes. And so there's, if you talk about from a scientific perspective, meaning scientific that you're actually <clears throat> being able to set up a baseline and then being able to measure a difference, right? Or what you have done. And obviously before all that, there'll be specific steps we talk in each, in each of the stages that we mentioned for Addy. Um, if you have the scientific approach, then you need, to have, you need to have a good foundation on the, the origins of it and why it's set up. So originally, the, the, the critical piece here is that, well, there's nothing, there's no one that claims Addy, no one created Addy, and Addy has been sort of labeled to be a colloquial thing they came about. However, when you go read that article, you'll find out that there was a program set up in the 70s, 1978 out of Florida State University, uh, Dr. Robert Branson, and some folks, they're academics, right? But they were called upon by the Army <clears throat> because at the time, there was a problem with a lot of folks coming back from Vietnam and they had no education or no specific uh, levels of education. And the army wanted to sort of skill up or level up. So at the time, you had people coming back from Vietnam. They needed to get jobs. And then the second piece, also, the army wanted to recruit people that were higher, you know, level up on things. So the source of this, because um, you may be asking, well, how do you know that? Uh, the source of this can be found if you kind of trail back to something called the um, inner service. Procedures for Instruction Systems Design. Um, so inner service procedures, meaning that it was something that was created, uh, sponsored by the Army, but it was created for all military services to be used as a, as a guide for instructional programs. And that, in that model, or in that IPA, ISD model, there was something, there were five stages, and those five stages were called um, analysis, design, development, implementation, but the last one was called control. So it wasn't called evaluation. Now, when you look at control, inside of the control stage, everything that goes into it is based on evaluation. And it's not just evaluation of whether people learn anything or anything like that, but it's also based on evaluation of your program, of your design, of your specifics, which is, which is super important, I think, if you are if we're going to be doing instructional design because you want to know if the process that you're following, you know, meets somewhat of quality standards. So you can always improve in, the, in your practice. Otherwise you just keep doing what you know, right. And just never improve on what you're doing. So you get a dick coming from there, ADDIC. And, um, and that is, those are the five stages. And that is something that, yes, it, it, it does come from somebody. Robert Branson and an alumni over at FSU. There was a <clears throat> professor, Melinda, from uh, Indiana University that in 2002 or three or something like that, I forget the reference right now, but he looked at, he went and searching, he has an article out there you can find, if you just Google it, you'll find it, uh, in search of the uh, elusive Addy model. And the, the main reason being is because we have to understand the difference between a framework and a model. A framework or a process is just a very schematic view from the top of things that happen in the relationships. As opposed to a model, a model is a detail, a description of what needs to happen and the input, the most important part is the input and output variables. So things that need to, you need to have in place so at the end you come out with something. So everybody heard, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? Yeah. If you can put garbage, then you'll put out garbage. And so <clears throat> the Addy model, if you consider it to be a model, 
then you need to have those input variables. The input variables you can find if you look at the original ADEC model, which will give you about 19 steps. Uh, and they're all divided per each of the stages. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. So okay, good. I want you to keep going and because um, <laughs> I didn't know about the C for control. I knew that it yeah. came like from um, from the military and I was familiar with that, but then I did not know about, you know, a dick. <laughs> yeah, I know. So yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems with that. Right. I mean, we can say uh, it sounds funny when you say it. Right. Um, um, you know. Uh, it sounds funny when you say it, and also it can be confused with addiction, right? So addict uh, or something like that. But, um, but whatever reason, I, you know, the, I think the biggest piece is, and then in the article, I kind of break that off on, on LinkedIn. Um, it seems to be, I went over and did uh, the question I wanted to answer. So first of all, I wanted to answer two questions. This was Really, if you think about it, if we talk about it in a geeky way, it was a scientific endeavor. I wanted to find out, answer two questions. A, where does Addy come from? And B, when did it change? When was it a dick? You know, it was a dick, and then all of a sudden it turned into, a, into Addy. So, <clears throat> hard to say. Um, the only thing I found is that I was able to use this tool by Google. It's called Ngram, and the letter N and Gram. And uh, that tool kind of gives you like um, the the recurrence of words in a in, in used in books, right? So like, let's say if you wanted to find, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the 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 word, the word phrase instructional design, you can search it and then find you know when did it start appearing in literature. Oh, neat! It's like etymology so, yeah. for books. Yeah, yeah, there you go, etymology. So I did a. I did some of that. Um, I, I used it. And the funny part was that it, it's all about timing in life, right? Because I didn't know about this tool. And the only reason I found out about the tool was because I was having a discussion with my, I was having a, <laughs> this is, sounds funny. I think it's going to sound funny, but I was having a uh, discussion or, or argument, if you would, with my son, with my oldest son and my wife about barbecue, right? So why is barbecue BBQ? It doesn't make sense. There's no Q in it, right? <laughs> so, so like, where is barbecue where BBQ? And they're like, well, because they started saying something like this and that. And I'm like, you know, being me, I'm like, okay, well, that's great that you guys think that. I'm going to Google it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I started Googling. I found this guy who did an article, and he used the Ngram tool, and he kind of broke it out. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I can probably use this to do the other thing, and that's why I would have came to it. But anyway, it seems like in 1995, um, in about 1985, someone, uh, there was a gentleman that wrote a book. There was a, a piece of literature that in 1985 that he mentioned the first kind of use of the, of Addy in literature. Right. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that that's the exact and, you know, the, the, the absolute answer, but it makes sense. The only reason it makes sense is because then in 2002, um, Robert Branch, uh, Professor Robert Branch and Ken Gustafson, they are, they wrote an article and um, they wrote an article about uh, in, a, in a journal and it's called What is Instructional Design? And so they broke down what instructional design is and the origins of instructional design uh, being the systematic approach, you know, very important thing, systematic approach. And then uh, when they broke it out, then they mentioned, if you look at, there are various instructional design models, but when you look at all of them, they all seem to do this. And then they said, they broke out Addy. They broke out and said, analysis, design, blah, blah, blah. So my only guess is someone grabbed either the 1995 mention or they grabbed that. I, that will be more popular because Robert Branch is really well known in working in instructional design and because of his work with Ken Gustafson and the fact that he wrote a book in 2009 named The Addy Approach, uh, which actually it's uh, recommended. It's one thing you want to do. And there is a off-the-cuff blog episode that I have with, with uh, Mr. Branch that covers all of that. It's also in the article that I mentioned. 
But anyway, um, that's what it came down to. Now, if you add to all of this, Robbie, if you add then, um, you know, all the marketing fluff and our industry, how it's heavy with vendors and stuff like that. I mean, I don't have to convince you of this stuff. You can just Google Addy right now and you'll find that probably the first 10 results are full of blah, blah, blah. And don't mention anything on what I'm talking about. And that's the reason why I kind of did the research that I did for that. Yeah. And so now that you've done your research and you mm -hmm. know the history of Addy, um, do you still think it's a worthwhile model or do you have certain yeah. times when you'd use it and not use it or? Yeah, I think, I think Addy is a, is, there are different things depending on how you approach it. So if you approach it as a framework, it's a nice guidance as to a sequential thing that you, you want to follow um, and to know what you do first and what you do second and what you do third or whatever. Um, if you use it as a model, it could also be a powerful thing. There are some criticisms about Addy. Some of them are, um, are, are sort of misinformed as well, right? So here are the main things to consider. The most powerful training system in the world and one of the most accurate training systems in the world right now is in, it's been forever is the U.S. military, right? So U.S. military uses the principles of Addy and they use the full-blown system of it. Yeah, they have done different things. And actually, a fun, funny note that I can tell you being a veteran is that anything that you will create for all services to use will never be used. Right. So <laughs> when they created the IPISD, it was supposed to be for all services in a way, like a general sort of guidance. And, you know, that that didn't work out. You, you look back and then you see the Army did their own thing. Uh, the Air Force did their own thing. And uh, many, the Navy did their own thing. However, they all refer to it in terms of uh, being uh, the process they follow. Now, the key thing is that the criticisms of Addy are the following, right? So, okay, Addy is a linear model. Mm -hmm. It's old and it's linear. Well, um, yes and no. So, Addy started as a linear model, yes, because it was part of a big, you know, factory line of training, right? Um, how else do you grab someone that's been living 18 years on their own way, their own things, and bring them under the same umbrella and in two months, you know, come out with people that understand the same cultural values and principles and procedures and how to dress and how to do that. That's the military. That's what, that's what happened there. So it was a linear process. However, when you review the, and, and the great thing about this, is, although this is available to you publicly, you can just go online and look for the army uh, trad doc. It's called training document. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> Um, instructions and you'll see what's there and I put links on the article as well for that so really the article is kind of golden right now for you I'll say if you want to find anything about it but the criticism for that is linear well no the army reviewed it and they made it also to be iterative so there was an uh, iteration process with between evaluation and all the stages same with the Air Force Air Force did the same thing in the 90s and in the 2000s <laughs> so it's naturally a, a linear process. Uh, it, was, it hasn't been for about, I don't know, 20 some years now. The other criticism is, well, it's too slow. Yeah, it could be too slow <laughs> because you have to consider that Addy was created for, Addy was created for a megalith, you know, megalithic, huge organization with lots of resources and money. So if you're one instructional designer sitting by yourself and you are the team, quote unquote, the team, then Addy, perhaps you may just benefit by thinking that you're doing sort of a framework, but don't, don't, may not benefit too much by trying to follow the whole thing. Now, we got to get, we got to get into what real Addy means, right? So real Addy would mean that in your analysis, you're not just talking to people and finding out what content they have. You're finding out the things about the environment. You're looking at things in a systemic way. And also you are being learners, learner centric in your approach, because one of the other criticisms that we have about Addy is that it's not learner centric. So <clears throat> when you're looking at, um, 
Addy, there will be situations in which you will need to do a job task analysis. There will be situations in which you will have to do a target audience analysis. There will be situations where you have to do a environmental analysis, like go and go get out of your desk and go see the work environment where people are at. Um, and obviously our context matters in all of this, right? So yeah, you know, if you're trying to teach a specific set of skills around some machinery, and you probably want to see what that machinery looks like, what are the environmental pieces around it, um, what people, you know, what analyze the people, the level of education they have, the, you know, what makes the great performer and what makes the low performer in, the, in those type of situations. So all of those places come into, in, into play. And usually when you hear people talk about Addy, that is not often what comes around. Now, if you look at the steps of the ADIC model in the beginning, and the iterations from the army and, the, and this and that, then you'll see that those are uh, critical pieces there. You get to the design piece and now you, you know, it makes sort of sense if you think of it, right? Okay, I did an analysis. I can't see where the problems are at. I can't see where the gaps may be. Uh, gaps in performance, gaps in, you know, productivity, all of this stuff. You should be able to determine at that point whether you need training or whether you need a performance support piece. Right. Right. Um, and when you get to the design stage, then you design what it is that you are going, how you're going to solve this problem. So if you're saying it's not a training problem, meaning that people know what they're doing, they just don't care <laughs> or they just don't know where to get the info or they just don't follow the processes. But when you ask questions to them and you interview them, they know everything they're supposed to know about the thing then that's a performance issue. So you're not going to solve a performance issue with a course because they already know what they need to do. You just need to find out what would be some of the things you can change in their environment that would allow them or they will enable them to actually do what they need to do. Then if you find out the training is the need, then you go into the design with the training perspective, right? With the instructional strategy and whether, and then, you know, we see that varies into, I'm going to use, I'm going to use learning versus I'm going to use uh, instructional -led training or I'm going to use both or, you know, it, it really depends and it really, it, you have to analyze that. And when you get to the same piece, then you write your learning objectives, learning objectives. And you have different, different elements of that performance objectives, behavioral learning. Right. Yeah. And so you probably want to know that you, may want to reference Bob Manger on that, or you want to reference, <clears throat> um, you know, there's another misperception out there, the Bloom's taxonomy is your solution for that. Uh, and, and it's not based on the blogs that I've done with Lauren Anderson, who's the guy that wrote the revision with Bloom's taxonomy. Don't worry, I went to a master's degree that taught me the wrong things. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so the, and that could be another episode. Yeah. So, <laughs> so anyway, so you figure out what it is that you're going to do in the design phase. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that you don't care about the learner. There's empathy there. You have to be concerned with the learner. You have to be learner centric, but you also have to keep in mind what is it that you're trying to achieve based on your analysis. And you have to marry those two and go into play. And then the development um, goes into different ends. But, you know, the thing about it is there's a, there's a gap between what that was, that practice, the original practice of Addy was, and what a lot of people are doing in private businesses. So if you work now as an instructional designer in, some, in several companies, you have to be careful of what is it that the employer wants. A lot of employers, what they want is someone that can develop content. Yeah. And not exactly do all of this. So you may find yourself out of a job if you, you know, if what you want to do is, is, is true instructional design and really what they just want you to do is uh, development, uh, develop content. Now, the, um, when you go into development, obviously, if you're in that private situation where you're developing content, you are the, the person making everything. You're making it all and you're figuring out. And that's, that's the fun part. Everybody loves that. I love that. Me too. And no problem. Yeah. I, I, I can spend all day uh, making stuff in storyline or the videos and all that absolutely implementation is about it's just it's a systemic approach as well when you get to the implementation stage it's not just thinking oh well i made my course i put it in the lms we're done um there are 
you know, communication strategies that you need to put in play. There are uh, troubleshooting uh, schemas. There are, um, you know, uh, sustainment plans that you should put in your implementation piece, i.e. what happens when something breaks? Are people just going to open a ticket uh, and bog, you know, and bog down on the IT system? Do you have a partnership with IT folks? All that comes into play, right? And so, again, when you talk in, in, in some conversations, you'll hear Addy and they say implementation. Well, I just polished the course. That's it. <laughs> Implement it. So, um, so then there's that. And what's interesting enough is then that Addy at the end, uh, whether you look at a C or an E, um, that usually drops out. Like no one, that's my biggest probably pet peeve in, in all of it because Again, where we go is garbage in, garbage out. So if you started with a poor analysis, your evaluation is going to be garbage, technically speaking, because, again, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So um, the evaluation piece always very, it's very seldom that you that you find someone that is truly applying some evaluation strategy beyond a ten question quiz at the end of the course. So you have to ask yourself questions as a designer. Right. If you're really wanting to impact change in the organization and affect the people that you were helping there, why would you make a, just a 10 question quiz at the end of the course? Um, I mean, you have a one hour course, but only 10 questions at the end. You have a 30 minute course, but only 10 questions at the end. It seems to me that if you're doing a 10 question course, a 10 question quiz, that's not equivalent to 30 minutes of content. So those kind of things you have to think about. So what message are you sending to the learner in those perspectives? Learners that are educated, they will look at that and go, yeah, I don't, what's this with 10 question quiz? Like, I just need to pass this quiz. And that's why you get people that, you know, will take the quiz 40 times, fail it until they pass it. But they're not really caring about watching all that work that you, do, that you did before. So, I mean, you know, worst case scenarios, good case scenarios, but it's something to keep them. So that's Addy, right? That's where we get to Addy. So Addy, truly in evaluation, you should be looking more at, you know, the formative, the summative evaluations, right? Um, as, you're, as you're going through that iterative process of Addy, you're evaluating if your analysis was on point a little bit here and that. But there are some problems in there too because then you have scope problems. And a lot of, a lot of things that Addy is not going to give you is project management. So those are things, those are skills that the instructional center kind of has to learn. That's why there's so much uh, there's so much room for other other ideas or or disciplines to kind of step in and people use them as replacements for Addy, i.e. Agile. You know, but before I get into Agile, let me tell you about HPT. Right? Yeah. So, human performance technology actually. If you kind of look back, it kind of stems out of the whole systemic pro uh, approach to instruction. And what it is, is fills in the gaps of, of what the instructional programs did. Because when you look at systemic instruction, which kind of dates back to 1965, there was a guy named Silver who kind of started writing uh, the systems approach to training, right, SAT. Uh, that kind of gave the base to Addy. And Addy then, you know, take it, took it all the way, you know, blown out for the military for full implementation, ready to go. But out of that, there were gaps, obviously, as I was mentioning. So the, the biggest gaps in Addy were the beginning, and actually the most important pieces of Addy are really the first two stages, um, kind of drive the rest of things. So human performance technology now starts looking at performance so it's not just based on instruction it comes out of the instruction thought because of the systemic view but it's really more focused on performance so um there are there's plenty of stuff out there to read uh one of the biggest proponents of it is rumler um but you're a rumler but um Ideally, human performance technology, and it's still a field that runs today, it kind of borrows a lot from industrial organizational psychology, which I think should be really the, the main field that, that rules everything that we're doing because it deals with how people <laughs> work in, in the industrial world, but hey, that's just me, um, or organizational world. 
but um but essentially when you look at human performance technology you're looking now at a systemic view and you're looking at the variables that affect what people how people work and this and that so the answer for in in hpt is never instruct it's not always instruction it's instruction plus something else there's something there's always something else and that's usually you hear this quote like you know inside of every fat course there's a nice thin performance support job aid <laughs> gets you all the answers you need um so yeah it's um not everything has to be a course it's what you can learn from hpt not everything has to be a course um you're so in you just because you call yourself an instructional designer doesn't mean that you make the only thing you make is instruction um you you know one of the biggest pieces again in the beginning when you're doing analysis is you are the one that needs to make the decision is this a training issue or is this a performance issue and if it's a performance issue then you probably want to start using hpt methodology the only problem we have today is that look all these areas we have a lot of misinformation all around so when you go i think if you want to use hpt there's two people you need to follow, or two things, two entities you need to follow. The first one is Guy Wallace. It's a guy that, um, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> Guy Wallace. He's also a U.S. Navy veteran. You see him in LinkedIn a lot, and a good friend of mine. He is, he's been doing um, HPT and performance driven stuff, and he's been a, a part of the board and found sort of, if not founder, a really involved member of what is called the ISPF, right? So the International Society of Performance Improvement. Um, so those are the biggest resources you got. Guy Wallace and ISPI. ISPI.org, look it up. You'll find uh, HPT model and HPT model in there. But it's just good to know. I'm not saying that, you know, I think actually if you apply it, if you approach everything as HP, from, HP, from an HPT standpoint first, I think it will be more helpful than just thinking everything I'm going to do, I'm going to do at it. Because again, if you go back to a scientific approach, right? Just imagine if all our scientists did science based on one way, <laughs> you know, like one, one, they were just going to follow one process. <laughs> so um, that's what you got to think. So if every problem you have, you're going to solve with Addy or, an instructional design model, then, you know, there, there's definitely gaps you have to appreciate there. All right. So that's Addy and HPT. You got any questions? Well, I was just going to make um, a couple of comments. Like, first of all, like yeah. I appreciate your point of view and like way you broke down Addy because that's actually how I teach my students, you know, the same kind of thing. Like, yes, it is um, a framework and it is a model. And they say that it's, uh, you know, waterfall or linear, um, but really in practice, it is iterative. And um, it's so interesting about HPT because, um, you know, that's definitely something that's um, in my own practice. And I think that um, Kathy Moore, like her action mapping kind of does a good job of combining both like an Addy and an HPT methodology because she does like a large piece up front about, you know, is, is training required or not? And she has like this entire um, branching that goes through like what, you know, is it a performance issue and what kind and what are some of those solutions besides training? Mm, I see. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. So there, there are some people out there that kind of have made uh, some things look, let's say more, more um friendly for people that are not no no and that, that's not meaning you know any less or any more it's just saying i think there's some good translators out there research one of them has been uh ruth clark for example uh, when i when i dr ruth clark when i interview uh merrill david merrill and when i interview uh interviewed um um richard mayer right um multimedia learning design principles um, Rich, Richard Mayer and David Merrill as first principles of instruction. Um, they both mentioned uh, Dr. Clark. So, yeah, absolutely. It's no issues there. I think the main thing is that, and always, what I would say to anybody else is like always question things and don't go by just because, you know, a person is speaking at a conference that you have to follow that. You, what you want to do is always question 
that. Take the other side of that argument. So if somebody's talking to you about Agile, okay, great. Agile is this and is that and I get to know what it is. Now, hmm, how does it not work? How can I find that out? Because that, that'll pretty, probably be your best guidance. And uh, yeah, MapIt has been a, a good way to kind of simplify the concepts so that could be, you know, very bogged down. Yeah. So yeah, so um, so yeah, you, know, you got those two things, right? And those are two primary things that you can use in any business. And and the main thing I will say, the advice that I give instructional designers are new, is that you just need to know the stuff. You don't have to teach it to anybody else. So you just need to be knowledgeable about the stuff and then apply it in your practice. But one of the mistakes that a lot of people do is they want to teach everybody else the stuff. Yeah. So you, you know, you're, you're working in a business with business people that don't really care how you're making the sausage, right? So um, they just want a hot dog. So um, make sure that you're not that person. <laughs> so, because you could, you could, it's very easy to be that person. Trust me. It's very easy to be that person. I made that mistake before as well. So yeah, it's, um, it's one, th- one key golden, golden nugget there to take. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, think about it when you go see a doctor, right? So, you know, if you go see a doctor or if you go see a plumber, you got, you go see a plumber, you got a leak in your sink, thing, water spilling everywhere. So he comes over, shuts down the water. Um, and, and, you know, fixes it and you're not, you know, he's not there going, well, I'm shutting the water down because so that will maintain things from spilling more. And then I'm going to come here and look and see what you have, you know, like you need to know. That. So it's the same thing. You're not going to sit in a meeting and go, well, guys, what I'm doing is at you. <laughs> yeah, 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 don't worry. All right, cool. So let's talk about agile. Then, right. So agile is, is, I think they, they just got to break it down in connotation, right? Connotation is the biggest thing because context is everything. So if we're saying that you need to be agile because Addy is too big, Addy is a dinosaur for your organization, and you need to be agile, meaning that the, the literal sense of the word, meaning that you need to move a little faster and things, great. Sure. Find a way to modify things and, and go there without sacrificing, obviously, quality. Mm-hmm. But the, the biggest thing that we're seeing is that we're seeing books come out and we're seeing uh, people that, um, A, never wrote a line of code in their lives, right? So, um, and never were a software developer. And they're now saying, well, agile for learning and development, agile for instructional design. And that's really just, um, I, can see, I can only credit that to two things. A, you are... Um, you know, we're, we're modeling after business people because I've seen business people do this a lot where business people, you know, business is not really based on science or research or anything like that. A lot of people just do work and then they just, they just, yeah. I mean, they just do work and they, they listen to, they listen to the, the hot thing, the trendy thing. And then they start, oh, they all start talking about it. So that's what you got. Like everybody talking now about design thinking, and everybody talking about agile. Um, but, you know, in the next two years, it'll be something else. So um, at the same thing that happened with, you know, um, um, Lean and Six Sigma and all that stuff, some elite organizations have an actual program t- that prepares people to do this stuff. But for the most part, a lot of people just, you know, hearsay and then they go, oh, yeah, we're agile. We're doing this. And I guess then if you're an instructional designer sitting in that group, then you hear about it and you know you don't want to be the one person the odd person out right you don't want to be the the old man at the top of the hill with the two books yelling at the sky um so no that's not how it's done <laughs> <laughs> so um so yeah because you know you wind you find yourself out of a job i guess uh we're still human so the the main thing with agile is look agile was developed for software development Agile is a process where 70 some, and, and I'm just saying this because in my quest of doing things, I became a certified Scrum master. Let me just clarify that, right? So Scrum is a way of doing Agile. And um, I got deep into what it is that you do with that. But 70 some people, uh, developers, very smart, very intelligent people, got together over in Utah 
and they they broke they sat down and said, look, the way we're doing things doesn't work. Waterfall, which is like an actual software development process, right? Uh, waterfall uh, doesn't work. We're we're too bogged down. We we can't do. It. We got to do a, a new way of doing things. So out of that, there was two things that came out. One was extreme programming, and the other one then, you know, part of it, what it all came out was agile. There were twelve. They wrote a manifesto. Basically, they got together and they agreed. And they wrote a manifesto, and they got twelve principles that go into that. When you read those principles, they mention nothing about people learning. And they mentioned nothing about instructional design and none of that, right? It's all about customer satisfaction, software development. So ask yourself a question. Are you a programmer? Are you a software developer? Probably the answer would be no. And therefore, why are you following that, right? Now, can you modify? Yeah, you can modify anything. But now we're getting into, well, I'm just going to make my own thing. I'm gonna make my own life. See what happens, right? Um, so it's kind of like if you get to a doctor and uh, the doctor's like, no, you know, yeah, the American Society for whatever medical says this, but I'm gonna do my own thing. You know, why don't you uh, take this? Right? So, so the main thing is, look, do you care about your practice? And you do that. I think Agile can provide some good elements of it, um, but what a lot of people seem to be calling Agile is just iteration. Yeah, meaning. Cycling, right? The, the review cycles. And that's not agile. That's just good project management. Um, so if you're a good project manager or if you know good foundations of project management, you know that you're going to have review cycles on a specific schedule. You're going to set up your schedule, uh, what we usually call communication schedule, and you're going to set up a schedule to check statuses and things. Now, the way agile works is a whole different thing. If you're applying it with a, a Kanban, you know, you got different approaches to it. Scrum is one of the most popular ones. And the one thing you need to know about Agile is the following. And that I think that you could use in instructional design. I think it could, I think there are some scenarios where you can use it in instructional design. They will be awesome to, to use it. So I'm going to break those two down right now. So I'll tell you what Agile is meant to do. Agile is meant to do, to do teamwork, to have people in the same location working on the same thing in getting it done quicker because of that. So let's listen to that again, right? Teamwork, people organized in the same location, working on the same thing. Therefore, you get things done faster. So <clears throat> is a, com a comparison to that is, so now you got to think of how you work as an instructional designer. If you're an instructional designer in the small to medium firm and there's only two of you, could you do Agile? Well, possibly. But that means that you're working on one project, the two of you, at the same time. And you're organizing the way you do it. So within that set, and I've done this before, and it was very, very successful. I got to do it with uh, two teammates. It was three of us, and we worked on one project. But, one, but we had to decide the following. We had to decide who was going to be the SME Wrangler, right? So who was going to... Who's going to do the communication and the management with the SMEs? Who is going to do the writing? And who is going to do the storyline work, the, the actual design development stuff? So obviously, as you can tell for what I've, what I've seen and do, I was the storyline guy. They gave me the, they gave me the keys to, to do the storyline design. I did the storyline design. They, uh, the other person did the writing. The other person did the, the SME negotiations, wrangling, status updates, all that stuff. So that worked great. That was a great, that was a great thing. We did a project that I'm really proud of. And that was, that was a great thing. It worked out. Was it truly agile? No, it wasn't because we didn't have a product owner labeled. We didn't have a product backlog. We didn't have sprints and we didn't, you know, <laughs> all of these are elements of agile. So in software development, the connotation, the context is different. When you're doing software development, you're talking about budgets that are like millions of dollars. Are you working as an instructional designer or something that's millions of dollars? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Because first of all, your training, your training department has a hard time as it is just to find your position. So, right? <laughs> so we'll figure that one. So yeah. 
So, I mean, you know, if you want to call it agile and you want to say I do agile and it sounds cool because everybody is using it, okay, great, go with that, no problem. I mean, I'm, I believe, you know, look, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Navy veteran, I'm a veteran, I believe in freedom and doing whatever you want to do, that's great. But the question is the sense that what you're doing, does it lead anyway and does it have substance? And uh, are you just following it for the right or wrong reasons? That's the question. So agile is for software development. Agile is for working, you know, practices that encourage a lot of teamwork, meaning, you know, at times there's side, what is called side-by-side -side development, which is imagine two instructional designers sitting on the one computer and kind of talking to each other and working on the design piece, right? Often the instructional design piece, when it gets to the development piece, it's a very, very um, individual endeavor, especially if you're doing any learning. You don't see a lot of people um, saying, oh, well, the, Bob and Mary are working together on the same file, no. <laughs> right? But, if, it is, but if, it, if you have the room for it, then great. You can do something of that. And there, perhaps you can modify some of the practices of Agile. Now, Agile is Agile because it works and it has a specific parameters to follow. Um, if you follow Scrum, for example, there's a need for a Scrum Master. And the Scrum Master is a very enigmatic character because um, they don't really do anything. I mean, the, what they do is actually support, it's like a servant leader, right? So they support the team and they ensure the Agile is done right so that you're practicing, um, that you're following the principles, basically, is what, what the Scrum Master is doing. So... The, um, but you have to get familiar with those things and know what, the, what that means and how does that lead to things because it could help. It could, it could be something where you're, you know, if you're doing a project, they'll take you, i say four months. You could probably do, cut the time in half to do a project. But there's much, there's some work you have to do with that. There are things like, for example, having a team usually teams require if you're doing scrum the best the team the best uh number of team the team members is, is between it's like six or eight right so imagine working on a project where you have like six instructional designers or, or it's a combination of of your instructional designers and SMEs and whatnot and then the second piece is that your SMEs on a regular traditional basis they are not people that are going to be dedicated to your project so that also presents a challenge from the agile perspective because you have to be dedicated to the project. So you meet in the morning, you meet, you do a, what it's called a daily scrum, right? Or, and uh, you meet in the morning and you do sort of status check or check for impediments and things like that. And that means that the rest of the day you're working on where you need to be working because the next day you have to meet and do the things. And that's how you, at the end of the week, right? Now you're doing a reflection exercise and uh, and you're pretty much finishing the, the stuff that you committed to do for that week. So it is possible to implement it. It's possible to do it. Not likely, though. That's what I'll say about Agile. Right. It's, it's almost like, for instance, when I have a team of people, I'm not going to put them all in the same script. I'm going to be like, we got to write 14 modules. You each have two. And then we'll have one person like um, make it all sound like it came from the same like the same, you know, point of view and voice at the right. end. And that's a lot faster um, in my experience and, you know, even in my own company than like everybody discussing and trying to figure out like how to work on the same document. Yeah. So that, that's the one piece is like, I think in, in the future, um, I, I, you know, tools now, there's a lot more, we got a lot of many, uh, more tools that are collaborative tools for that, but, uh, to enable that type of work, but you have to change the culture as well. And the, you know, the same goes for design thinking. You have to change the culture. It's not just you believing in design thinking and then everybody else is just going to follow what it is. Because then we go back to that same problem that I was mentioning before is that if you follow design thinking, awesome. Now you're cool like designers, but you have to then ensure that everybody else around you is working with design thinking. So how are you going to do that? Because otherwise you're talking to yourself or you're becoming that person that we talked about before that. Oh, well, let me tell you guys what we're going to do. We're going to do the same thinking, you know? So, um, you know, uh, 
you gotta change people's behaviors and and that's 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 not something we achieve overnight right so oh my gosh this has been so good alex so you have like really just i mean illuminated um some of the common misperceptions about like addy and hpt and agile and i think you've given uh you know people a lot of things to just kind of walk away with as far as like like okay yes addy fallen iterative process lit uh hpt and form uh, my analysis piece and um that's maybe something they want to go and do some more research on so um i really liked your advice about how you know you shouldn't be that know-it-all in the room that tries to uh explain or you know whatever what's about like we should come up with a word for mansplaining for instructional design explaining <laughs> <laughs> you don't want well you know it's 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 a natural behavior that i think is it's not anybody's fault i mean sure. if you're you know if you get a if you get a master's degree your life changes and your vision changes and things so and you know this you've got a phd so you know if you're the only phd in the room <laughs> you gotta really like hone it you know calm it down and understand that not everybody's going to be talking at the same level with you so it's the same situation and you got to be careful of that because it's very easy for you to go like well that's not really how it works <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> so then you'll be the old lady at the uh geico commercial you know the insurance commercial yeah the unfriend you <laughs> <laughs> I don't friend you. <laughs> this is not how this works. Yeah. So that's one of my favorites. Anyway. Well, okay. And so that was like really good advice. So what, what do you want to leave, um, you know, our idol nation with as far as like your best advice um, for those that are trying to transition into this field? Um, just your best tips. I mean, whether it has to do with this model or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know, if you, I think, you know, always be concerned that there's two things you're going to be doing. I think the most of what you're going to be doing may be developing instructional materials as an instructional designer. So if you're going to do that, I mean, get yourself a copy of the first principles of instruction by David Merrill, because there's people already like him. They already worked on this. They already worked on the real, on a very advancing theories of how people learn and they give you the examples and they give you the knowledge and the wisdom for it. The, what I like about Merrill is that Merrill was really a, he was ahead of his time. I mean, he, he's still alive. He's still with us, thank God. But he was ahead of his time when he was in his, in, in his prime. I mean, he was putting out this book, The First Principle of Instruction, has examples that he's doing on PowerPoint. Okay, now you got to think that when he put this book out, it wasn't really probably the only authoring tool out there may have been captivating, but he was just, he was using PowerPoint and he was showing examples of graphic examples of how to apply problem-based learning, how to apply, you know, sound instruction strategies. And that will give you like so much fuel for you to be able to kind of hone into your practice. So that definitely there. And if you want to, you know, if you want to really spice up on the performance support piece, check out some of the human performance uh, literature, or at least, you know, read some about uh, Rumler for, for, and Guy Wallace, obviously. Uh, it's probably the easiest resource to use. He's always on LinkedIn. <laughs> this has been so good, so informative. I feel like I've just been um, soaking in, uh, you know, a lecture from someone I actually wanted to pay attention to. So, <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us, Alex. I really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. And hello to all the idols out there. And, uh, you know, uh, if you see me on LinkedIn, go ahead and send the request to connect and be glad to help out in whatever case I can help with. Oh, my gosh. You're going to get so many LinkedIn connections. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode and information about our programs at idlecourses.com. If you like this podcast and you want to become an instructional designer and online learning developer, join me in the Idle Courses Academy where you'll learn to build all the assets you'll need to land your first job 
early access to this podcast, tutorials for how to use the e-learning authoring tools, templates for everything course building, and paid instructional design experience opportunities. Now get out there and build transcendent courses. Thank you.